out to others, encourage others to come, and so we're looking forward uh, to this day, the service this day. Uh, thank the Lord for his goodness. We had not quit saving, had not quit working in lives, and we praise the Lord for that. Amen. Got several announcements and things we want to put before you today a little bit, uh, in just a little bit, but um, we just, let's, uh, in a moment we're going to sing another song. Let's uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer if we could, and um, Scott, would you open us up in prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord, that you've given us the opportunity to be in your house and worship. Yeah. Lord, we ask that you just, just bless this day, Lord, and bless everyone that's here. And Lord, bless this service today. That yes. Somebody could uh, help somebody out in, in their life with the situation. We ask that you just continue to be with each and every one of us. <coughs> we'll continue to give you the honor and the praise and glory, Lord. In Jesus name.
getting some back and has been sick and everything's going right. nice. It's good to see Thanks some of you, as I said, we haven't seen for a while. Don't forget our service tonight, too. Starts at 6 o'clock and then Wednesdays at 7. And this could keep those things in mind. So far, we've dodged the weather bullet and all the snows. And again, it's good to see you here today. It's all spam.
Jones can go to his time downstairs for order his church. six weeks ago, maybe a little longer than that, preaching on what Jesus said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Alpha is a letter in the Greek for A, Omega is the last letter, it's an O, but it's at the last of, of the alphabet in the Greek language, which our Bible was translated from, from Alpha and Omega, that's A to Z, uh, we can see of Jesus. I've mentioned this almost every week. There are 218 names or titles for Jesus in the Word of God in the Bible. And so it's not easy, not difficult to go through and find. Some are titles. Some are more have to do with his character. And some have to do with just who he is. And so we're thankful for that. I'm not going to have you stand and read today from the Scriptures as we normally do. But I do want us to take this opportunity to think just a little bit. Now, the other night, uh, you know, Wednesday night, I took the opportunity to share uh, the letter in the alphabet, one of the letters, and we're up to the letter Q now, and you're probably thinking, is there a name or title for Jesus that begins with the letter Q? Well, there are several, more than you think there are, but uh, we're going to just zero in on one and then move to the letter R for just a moment. I'm not here to teach you about Jesus. I want to preach about Jesus. You need Christ. Everyone needs it. That's our only hope of heaven. And where we're going to spend eternity depends and hinges on what you do with Jesus Christ. Amen. And so as we preach about him and we preach Jesus to you, I hope and pray you'll see it's vital to your life uh, in, in any respect, but it's also uh, needful in your life as a child of God to know who you put your faith and trust in. I believe a lot of people, if they read their Bibles well enough and saw what Jesus did, there's some people that might renege on the fact of what they put their trust in. Jesus stood up and said some things that were pretty powerful and against the grain of some people. And Jesus was also willing to do things beyond what we think we can do because he's Christ. Now, as we look at this, I want you to see with the letter Q here, if we could. The letter Q is the word questioner. Jesus is a questioner. You may not think about this. We're always remembering the Sermon on the Mount, the things that Jesus taught, and the things that he preached about, the conversations that he held. But most of the time, Jesus responded to people with a question. Just think about this. Let me, let me just share a few with you real quickly. First of all, um, he said in the book of Matthew, have you not read what David did? That was a question. Have you not heard what he did? In chapter 12 and verse 5, he asked another question. Have you not read the law? Have you not read what he, what he hath made? Have you not never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings that I has perfected praise? Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? What think ye of Christ? Another question he asked. Whose son is he? And if David then called him Lord, how is it he his son? And so when Jesus wanted to muzzle the opinions and the statements of other people, he always asked a question. You know, that's one way to divert all the accusations and things that come our way and things that we know that be not true is just to return and put, put it on their plate as to what they believe and said. By the way, every one of those questions came from the Gospel of Matthew. And as we go through this, we remember Jesus asked questions. In the book of Proverbs, though, chapter 15 and verse 1, the Bible says, A soft answer turneth away wrath. Jesus was always stirring up the crowds with his miracles and the powerful things that he did in people's lives. Especially the Romans, but even the Jewish elite did not like to hear that from the Lord Jesus. So what did he do? He'd ask a question. In doing so, he put it upon them. Or he answered them softly or with very few words. It's kind of like when God showed up to Job in the Old Testament. And there was Job, this one who had faced all kinds of trials and adversity, problems, lost his whole, whole children, all of his children, 
he lost all this cattle, he lost everything in just a 24 hour period of time. It was all taken away from him. But you know what? When God showed up in that incident, the Bible says there lists over 80 some questions that he asked Job. Job sitting there thinking, I thought I could handle this. I thought I knew what was going on here. I thought I, thought I could go on and this would just all disappear. But then God said, where were you when I made the clouds? Where were you when I when the Leviathan showed up out of the deep? Where, where were you when I made this or that? Or put the stars in their place or a plant of the tree? Where were you, Job, with all that? You think you could come and question what I do in your life of me? good or bad in, in our, re, our relationship, he's going to come and do what he can, asking questions. And that's what Jesus is. He's a question. What question is he asking you today? Why are you taking so long? Why are you, why are you not reaching out? Maybe, just maybe he's saying, why don't you jump in there and teach a Sunday school class? <laughs> hey, listen, I'm telling you, the, the He's a questioner. He questions and he questions. The devil stands back as the accuser of the brother and said, you dirty rotten snake, look what you did. But Jesus comes with a question to get us to turn to him and see that he is the one who really has the answers to what's going on in life. I think of how he came. Jesus came to represent God. He came to redeem us, as we'll see in a moment. He came there as well to uh, take hold of sin and remit it from our lives. He came as well uh, to our minds to renew them and encourage us in our walk with the Lord. But he's our questioner. Just think of that. Thank goodness he asks questions and he asks the right questions to show that he and he only has the answers to those things. But then I think also, going to the letter R, he is our, he is our redeemer. Now, I was kind of hoping we'd see that this morning, but we didn't. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We teach the kids sometimes those, the old songs that, about redemption and about uh, the, the need to be redeemed and uh, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's our only hope is to be redeemed. You say, what does it mean to be redeemed? It means simply that Jesus reaches out and sees us in our condition to the bondage of sin and the things we go through, and he reaches down. And he touches us in such a way that he sets us free. A price had to be paid. A payment had to be offered. But Jesus offered himself on the cross so that he could purchase you and put you into his labor and adopt you into his family and make you a child of God. You can't just grow up one day and say, boy, I want to be a child of God. No, you have to put your trust in the Lord Amen. Jesus. You have to let him redeem you by the blood Amen. of the Lamb. No other way to heaven but through Christ. Amen. He is our redeemer. Amen. I think of Job. We just mentioned, I think of all his trials he went through. You get to the middle of the book. And he's sitting there and he's talking, using all these pronouns about himself. Knowing that he didn't do anything that really deserved this. But he stands forward. And one thing he says, I know. I know my redeemer liveth. Amen. <laughs> he's not dead. Amen. You know, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is, he is all of those, those thoughts. He's a present God, the I am of the New Testament. Oh, praise be to God today that we have someone who has the ability to redeem. And he's not dead, he's alive. Amen. And he's still purchasing people and buying back people from the life Amen. going astray. I'm glad that God doesn't give up on us. And sometimes we give up on him. Listen, there was a story of Ruth in the Bible wish we could spend an entire message with him, but we can't. But there's Ruth. She's a Moabite. One thing about a Moabite is, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, Moab is my wash pot. You have a pot that you use sometimes maybe to put dirty dishes as you're cleaning them up and let them sit there and all this food particles and other things lay in there after it's all done. The sun seem to go away when all you're left is a wash pot. The old timers would take that and maybe go outside and dump it out. But the Bible tells us that Moab was a wash pot, a, 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 this full of filth and offscout, heathen. And that's where Ruth came from. And yet that beautiful young maiden came back with Naomi, not knowing her future, not knowing what would happen, only to go out in the field and be able to 
did somewhat the poor people ate on the corners of the field. And Boaz, the owner of the field, looked out at her and said, listen, he says, I want you to come sup with us. And she did. After she got ready to leave, he heaped a bunch of, a bunch of grain on her lap as she pulled, pulled her like an apron up and he filled her with that and the baskets were sent home as well of, of barley and all the things that she could eat at that time. And as a result of that, Boaz said, I know she's a Moabite. She might mar my inheritance, but I'm going to take her and I'm going to redeem her. It's called in the Old Testament a goal, goel, a kinsman redeemer. And that kinsman redeemer stepped forward. And a time and place came when they came to literally what we would call the courthouse outside of the gate. He was willing uh, to take a man, offered it to him. He said, I don't want it. That's the law. It makes demands upon you, but it can't do anything for you. And here he comes and lays the money down, the purchase of, of Ruth. And then they're married and brought together. And as a result of that, their great-grandson is called David, the king of Israel who will reign. Hey, listen, folks, that's the way God works. God takes things that are hindered and trapped and bound, and he sets them free. It's Amen. called redemption. Amen. Redemption is what God does to all of us who will put our faith and trust in him. You can't get there any other way. You have to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. Amen. Not by the blood of Muhammad or the blood of Confucius or the blood of any other religious leader in history. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. He is salvation, your friend. He is redemption. He is the one who put our faith and trust in. He is all that and much more. I'm thankful for the redemptive power. The Bible gives us a Christmas message in Galatians 4 and verse 4. Where it says there, it says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son to be made sin for us. And can I say, when the fullness of time was come, there in Bethlehem came forth Mary, who bore that child, who came to be our Redeemer. Listen, you don't have enough money and enough good works and enough abilities to save yourself or redeem yourself. It takes someone. And you can sit here and listen to Bible preaching all you want to, but until you make that claim with Christ, that I believe and trust in Him, He is my Redeemer. He is the one. As I said, he's not looking for the powerful. He's not looking for the noble. He'd come to save that all people, but he came with a purpose. In his genealogy, in Matthew chapter 1, there are four different women mentioned there in the genealogy. And those four women were all heathen women. There was, first of all, there was Tamar. She was an Ammonite, one of the tribes that lived around them. There was Rahab, who was called Rahab the harlot. She was there and was a Canaanite who had already dwelt in the land. There was Ruth, who we already mentioned, was a Moabite. And there was also another one there by the name of Bathsheba, whom David buried. She was a Hittite. And through all of this, we see how God has weaved this wonderful plan for us to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. When I was a, when I was a young boy, probably junior high age, um, we had this down below our house, down there along the, 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 the there were just three stores there. There was a grocery store, a pharmacy, and a, and a, what we call a green stamp store. Now, some of you are old enough to remember that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, You'd go to the store and buy some milk and some other things, and then they would hand you green stamps. When you got enough green stamps, you would go down, and you could buy off the shelves anything you wanted as long as you had enough green stamps. And it was free. I remember I had my eye on a sleeping bag, because uh, I used to like to sleep out in tents and stuff that when I was <coughs> older. And uh, so I, I had my eye on it. Finally, I came to the day when I had enough green stamps. I laid that down, and they handed me that sleeping bag. You know, I used that sleeping bag from the time I was about nine or ten years of age. I, I, I had that sleeping bag up till about ten years ago. <laughs> I, I used that for well over 40 years. And so I just say, God purchases us 
And he purchases our life, our body. And he wants us to surrender to him because he has redeemed us. I wonder what would happen if everybody in this room today just said, I'm all out for God. I want to do what God wants me to do. And I want to be pleasing unto him. You're not going to find a perfect church or a perfect this or a perfect that, but you do find a perfect Savior. And that perfect Savior wants to redeem you if you have it. Amen. What a Savior. What a Lord. But he's not only a questioner. He's not only a redeemer. But he is also a restorer. I think also the story of A.J. Ford, who's a pastor in Boston, probably well over 100 years ago. And, and uh, <clears throat> he was, just could not find a message to preach on Sunday. He prayed, he thought, he thought he might have something, but he just, so he decided to go for a walk. He went for a walk away from his study and so forth, and he just walked for a couple blocks. He came upon some boys there in Boston that were there, and they, they had this cage, this old dirty bird cage. And they had collected up about three or four uh, birds, just field birds, and he brought them and put them in that cage, those boys did, and were taking around and were just playing with them and maybe even abusing them a little bit. But he saw those boys, and all of a sudden he said, Son, what would you give for those birds in that bird cage? Well, they said, Sir, you don't want to buy these birds. They're, not, they're not really not worth anything. He said, No, I'll give you $2. That was a good bit of money back then. I'll give you $2 for that cage and those birds. And those boys looked up at him, are you sure? He says, I'm sure. He took hold of that cage, handed him the $2, and walked away. And he took it, he opened that, and let those birds out. Because they weren't meant to be in a cage. They were being meant to set free. And then he took that bird cage, and he took it, and set it up on his pulpit in his church. And he preached on Christ our Redeemer. How he pays the price and sets us free. Amen. Listen, we've been bound by so many things that people have said and done. We've been bound by just the, the, the sins that, that come against us. We've been bound by problems and things we face. But Jesus came to set us free. Not to do what we want to do, but to do what we can to please him and follow him and worship him. As a result of that, we see also he is our restorer. You know, he restores a lot of things. We've had a, several pieces of furniture in our house. One was a table, and it was a nice table one time, but it was an oak table, and uh, we decided we would try to restore it. And some of the family got together, and they began to sand it down, and it took, took a long time. Just to make a long story short, when it was all said and done, that table looked brand new. But what had happened? It had been restored. There's a lot of us and a lot of Christians and a lot of lost people that need to be restored. And you know, Jesus is the restorer of life. He's restored many things. In the Old Testament, in the book of Joel, we see a plague that came called locusts. And they would come and devour just a path or something like 10 miles or 20 miles. And they would just go. And, and finally, they would come to an end and they would quit. But they would devastate everything. Think what that would be like today if, 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 if our economy faced something like this where maybe all the gas or the gasoline or the electricity, I'm not going to get into that, but anyway, all these things were taken away from us. It affect our economy, it affect our jobs, it would affect uh, inflation, it would affect everything that you could think of around us. We couldn't work in our homes, we couldn't take care of ourselves properly, and can I say today that... In the book of Joel, this locust plague had devastated the land. People were losing hope. Has God departed from us? What will happen? Joel raised up his voice and came to the people and said, I will restore the years that the locusts have devoured the land. I will restore it. He is the great restorer. He can restore you. Maybe you've been sitting on, sitting on your seat so long that you don't know what it's like to serve the Lord anymore. I'm not here to wind your clock about that, but I am here to tell you, Jesus wants to restore us, to give us back hope, to give us the things we need, to take part in things the way it ought to be. He is the restorer of life. He is restored not only in the locust plague in the Bible, but we see Jesus making the statement in the book of Matthew when he reached out and there was a man with a withered hand. It was all drawn up. And he couldn't use it. 
And he asked him to stretch forth his hand, and he did. And after a while, that hand was restored, and that withering had departed from him. I think of how the Bible says in Psalms 51, verse 12, he'll restore the joy of our salvation. Maybe you're saved, but you're just not happy. There's no joy flaming out of your life. He wants to do that. It's a matter of surrendering and let him take that purchase price and make a difference. He is the restorer. He provides comfort. Isaiah 57, verse 8. You need comfort. You need someone to kind of nurse you back. I'm here to tell you that's Jesus. The Psalm 23, verse 3, the great shepherd psalm, he restore, says he restoreth our soul. All that's within us, he restores. So through all of this, we see he is the great restorer of things. And in your life, he wants to be that restored too. Jesus is more than a savior. He wants to restore the years that the palmer worm and the locust had given upon the land. A number of years in London, there was a there was a young girl who, at an early, very early age, lost her eyesight. All the doctors in the area could not find anything that caused it. They didn't know what was going on. And finally, they found the, the dad found someone after many, many weeks and months of trying to find some help, sent her to a specialist. And to do this, he wasn't allowed to be there. It was just the specialist and those who worked with her and nurses and so forth, but they cared for her for several weeks. And they told her this. They said, it doesn't appear to be anything wrong with your eyes, except there's a film that's going over your eyes that's taking that away. And he says, if we can remove that film, it's going to be a dangerous thing, but if we can remove that film, we believe you'll be able to see again. She said, let's do it, Doc. And so they did. It started out, first of all, with six weeks of being totally in sunlight. And what they could, they could pierce through light. And they brought that upon her eyes and began to focus on her eyes and took her eyes. And after several months, they took, we're going to take the bandages off. And the dad was asked to be there and says, we have no idea whether this has altogether been successful or not. Now that she spent that six weeks under sun and then other care afterwards, they looked at him. And he says, okay, I, I want to be there. And so she came and sat down, and there was the, the young lady, now 16 years of age. And all of a sudden, they began to take the bandages off her eyes. And she looked up, and she started crying. Through all the pain that she'd been through and the battle she'd been through, the dad reached down, put his hand on her, and said, listen, why are you crying for? What's, what's wrong? Are you hurting? Are you in pain? And she says, no, Dad. But I didn't know that when I took those patches off, the first face I would see was you, Dad. I'm here to tell you. Every experience we go through in life, everything we go through is because there's a Lord and there's a God in heaven who's trying to work out so we'll be able to see him a little bit better. And he'll restore us and provide for us. Now I realize we've got people sitting right here in this auditorium this morning got cancer. Some that have been healed of cancer. we got people around here in this church that are going through other things. Great pain like Terry's been through. But I'm telling you, folks, the Lord wants to restore. As he went to that blind man, and the disciple said, who sinned, this man or his parents? He said, no, he was born for the glory of God. And Jesus showed up and touched his eyes, and he could see. Two-thirds of people that lived in the Roman Empire suffered from eye trouble from all the salt content in the Dead Sea and other places around. And as a result of that, Jesus could have spent every day healing people, but he didn't. But he is able to restore, folks, to place you where you need to be, give you the confidence that you need, to take away your sin, to also provide for you what you need to live the Christian life. I'm here to tell you today, we have a questioner, someone that will stand and defend us 
and turn the questions towards others. We also have someone who's our redeemer. And we have somebody in life who will restore us to the place that we are be. I'm just trying to tell you, as we start this new year out today, let's keep our eyes on Christ. Again, he's not just a name in a book. He's not just a person. He is a son of God. And he wants to restore homes. He wants to restore problems. He wants to restore things back the way they used to be. And even better, because he's the great restorer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Faith's been weak. But there's a good chance that a number of people here this morning, there's somebody here who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible says, Whosoever believeth in him hath, that's present tense, hath everlasting life. And he wants to provide that for you, for me, and for others. I know I'm saved. I saw an advertisement this week on the TV about heaven or not. And gave the opportunity for folks to search out a website that they might know that they're going to heaven. It's not a hope so. I think I am. I might be. <coughs> I should. It's a matter whether you are or you're not. Let Jesus be what he wants to be in your life. He wants to redeem you. As Paul said, for I am bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your life belongs to him. Amen. When he said, well, I want to do this, or I don't care what the Bible says. I want to do this, or I want to do this. No, he bought you. Part of that, he is your Lord as well as your Savior. And he has the rights to your life. But you must surrender and say, yes, I'm willing to do that. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm not even going to ask the question, but if you're here today without the Lord, will not you let somebody take a Bible and show you how you can be saved? Simple thing like believing, and yet so difficult for us to surrender. God help us today to realize that Jesus is everything. All the things we preached about these last six weeks, and what we've added to the list today, things that Christ is. He's every letter of the alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. If you'll stand with me, dear Father. I remember that Sunday evening before church. And the mother you gave me sat down and opened the scriptures, told me how to be saved. I've struggled a lot, Lord, it's if only because I want to do my thing. Oh God, would your sweet spirit pass over us today? Quicken us. For you're the quickener too. We ask, dear God, that you'll work in our lives and draw us closer to be. Thank you for these people that come and give their Sunday mornings to sit and hear somebody preach out about the Lord Jesus. Ask you, dear God, to give us help, give us guidance, give us direction, and save souls.